Welcome to Camry's program on a very important topic, applying legal action to fight anti-Semitism on campus. I'm Andrea Levin, Executive Director of Camera, and we are delighted to be presenting Kenneth L. Marcus, a leader in the battle, in this battle and a longtime friend. Very special thanks go to Stanley and Beth Feldman for their generous sponsorship of today's event. Before introducing Ken, let me say briefly how our activity on campus connects to the expertise of our guest. Camera works directly with students at colleges and universities across America, Canada, the UK and Israel, enlisting talented young people who want to speak out for the truth about the Jewish state. More than 60 camera fellows monitor their campus media and with our support and assistance publish widely on campus and beyond reaching tens of thousands of their peers with factual information about Israel. Our students all too often encounter biased attacks on Israel and Jews, sometimes harassment, and they benefit from Ken's groundbreaking legal efforts. So let me introduce our speaker, Kenneth L. Marcus, who is founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, former assistant U.S. Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, and author of The Definition of Antisemitism and Jewish Identity and Civil Rights in America. On the occasion of his recent transition from public service, the Jewish News Service Syndicate commented, JNS, that, quote, in two short years, Marcus did as much, if not more, to fight anti-Semitism on college campuses as anyone in government has ever done. Mr. Marcus founded the Brandeis Center in 2011 to combat the resurgence of anti-Semitism in American higher education. During his public service career, he also served as staff director at the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Marcus previously held the Lily and Nathan Ackerman Chair in Equality and Justice in America at the City University of New York's Bernard Baruch College School of Public Affairs. Before entering public service, Mr. Marcus was a litigation partner in two major law firms where he conducted complex commercial and constitutional litigation. He has published widely in, more, in academic journals as well as in more popular venues and you've probably seen his articles. Mr. Marcus is a graduate of Williams College and the University of California at Berkeley School of Law. So the format today will include our guests speaking for about 25 minutes and then we'll open up for questions. If you run your cursor along the bottom of your screen, you'll see the icon for Q&A. Please submit questions and we'll answer as many as possible. I must say that we had a tremendous uh, registration for this, more than 500 people, so we will get to as many of those as we possibly can. Zach Schildkraut, managing editor of Camera on Campus, who works every day on the challenges that students face, will moderate the questions. And now we are delighted to present Kenneth Marcus. Well, Andrea, I'm the one that's uh, delighted. Um, Andrea, you and I have been friends for many years. This is the first time I've had the honor of uh, addressing um, a camera audience. Um, but I have had the opportunity to work with you and also to be the beneficiary of camera's work, not just on a campus, but with uh, the media in the sense that uh, time after time, uh, I have seen uh, issues that I've been familiar with that have been distorted by uh, major media outlets that should uh, do better. And camera has held them accountable, uh, showing what the truth is, how they've gotten it wrong, uh, and pushing them to do better. And I think that um, uh, all of us who uh, depend on uh, media resources should be grateful for what uh, Andrea and camera are doing to um, hold uh, media accountable uh, to the truth, especially on Middle East reporting. So we're talking about the campus now, and I wanted to start before I go specifically into the legal tools by talking about the situation on campus, because I've been dealing with campus issues now for about 18 years. And it seems to me that there are two errors that people make uh, in talking about the situation of Jewish students on campus. The first is to overstate the problem and to think that it is just doom and gloom 
for Jewish students on college campuses. And it might be controversial with some for me to say this, but I believe that this is actually an excellent time uh, to be a Jewish college student, putting aside, of course, the challenges of the, the current uh, coronavirus. But I would say that the last few years uh, have seen uh, just a very strong um, uh, set of um, uh, resources for students ranging from Jewish studies and Israel studies programs to uh, Hillel programs around the country and Chabad. Um, it, this, is, this is really a, an, an excellent time to be Jew a Jewish college student. And I would say that from all of the survey data I've seen and from all of the students I've talked to, most students and most professors on college campuses are not anti-Semitic. In fact, philo-Semitism, favorable views uh, towards Jewish students run very high. And Jewish students in general are held in higher regard, according to survey data, than most other religion. So this is not a bad time to be a Jewish student on campus. The other problem is to understate the, understate the situation. Because while there is generally um, a great uh, number of resources and a number of people who are favorably disposed toward Jewish students, we're also seeing a significant rise in anti-Semitism over the last several years. And it's because it's the result of a small number of people with bad attitudes who are creating a negative atmosphere. And it really has gotten ugly. Now, ADL and AJC data are starting to show uh, that the situation in terms of both the college campus uh, as well as global anti-Semitism has gotten worse than it has in, in years. And to me, the problem is twofold. On the one hand, we are finding on college campuses terrible situations of harassment of Jewish students. So there are situations that are happening right now that are unforgivable and that have to be addressed. But the real thing, the real problem, and what really is why I devote myself to this work, is that we're going in the wrong direction. In other words, it's not just how bad things are right now. It is that we are no longer moving in the right direction. For half a century after World War II, we made significant steady progress in defeating anti-Semitism. And we could during any decade in the second half of the 20th century said, yes, there are problems. Yes, there are incidents, but we're better now than we were 10 years ago. We haven't been able to say that during this 21st century. For the last two decades now, we have not been able to say we're moving in the right direction. We are in fact moving in the wrong direction. Now it's not clear how far this is going to be, but what really scares me, and the reason that I think we have to make this a top priority, not just for the Jewish community, but for America, is that we know how bad things can get if left unchecked. We know that the progress that we have been making has stopped. And so the question is, what can we do today to turn things around? Now, there are different strategies. I believe in education. Education is important. I believe in Israel trips. They're important as well. There are lots of things that we can do. But it seems to me that if we're going to fight, if we're going to turn this around, there is no way in America that we can fight and successfully deal with anti-Semitism unless we use law and public policy as part of our arsenal of tools that we use to address the problem. And there are lots of examples. Just very recently, my friend Brooke Goldstein was successful with her lawfare project at preventing a terrorist uh, from using various sorts of uh, internet platforms uh, to uh, advance uh, terrorist goals uh, and attack uh, Israel and the Jewish community uh, at San Francisco State. That's one example, but there are many. People ask me, what are the tools that we can use to fight anti-Semitism on campus? Now, you know from Andrea's uh, kind introduction that civil rights has been my primary focus and civil rights tools are, I believe, the number one goal that we can use. But I wanna say at the outset that it's not all that we've got. We have lots of different weapons and we have to know when and where to use all of them. Certainly we've just seen, as I've just mentioned, anti-terrorism law can be important, for instance, in the San Francisco State example. But at the Louis D. Brandeis Center, we've had students who've been punched in the face. 
In one case, it was a student who was talking uh, at an SJP booth. And when they found out that he was anti-Israel, they hauled out and punched him and broke his nose. We had another student who was riding on a university shuttle bus and he heard the uh, young man in front of him screaming uh, repeatedly, um, effing Jews. And when he identified himself as Jewish, the guy turned around and punched him in the face. So we sometimes use criminal law and we sometimes use student conduct procedures, whether it's to remove a student from campus or otherwise to make sure that criminal wrongdoers are appropriately punished, especially when there's violence involved. Sometimes there are common law uh, approaches. For instance, what lawyers call tort law. If someone uh, is not given uh, the level of care uh, that is uh, required under the law, uh, there could be a common law remedy. So there are lots of different lots of different uh, procedures. Corporations law, surprisingly enough, became a very important tool uh, when the Louis D. Brandeis Center uh, was uh, fighting uh, BDS uh, within the academic association context. So for instance, we filed a lawsuit uh, just a few years ago against uh, academics who were trying to misuse the American Studies Association and to turn it into a tool to advance their ideological and political agenda through the BDS movement. Well, what we were able to argue was that they were violating corporations law uh, by misusing assets um, when they were members of the board of directors or officers of the, of the corporation. Our opponents, anti-Israel activists, went to the court and accused the Brandeis Center of single-handedly bringing the BDS move into a halt within academic associations. And what they pointed out is that before our lawsuit was filed, there were numerous successful BDS measures that were adopted by academic associations. By contrast, they pointed out, after we filed our lawsuit, uh, those, those uh, resolutions were no longer acceptable. And they thought that was an argument against us. Now I wanna be clear. The only reason to use the law is to do it appropriately when our cause is just, when the facts are true, when the law is on our side. We wanna make sure that we're only using the law in an appropriate and ethical way. But when our cause is just and our claims are, are sound, we absolutely should be using it. And what should we be using it for? Well, I would say that our goal on college campuses should be not just to win individual suits, and not just to punish uh, individual wrongdoers, but to change the climate. Long-term, our goal is to change the climate on college campuses so that anti-Semitism is treated as seriously as any other form of hate or bias, whether anti-Semitism manifests itself as a right-wing uh, form of white supremacy or neo-Nazism, or, whether it manifests itself as a left-wing form of anti-Zionism. Either way, it is important to treat it forcefully and as effectively as any other form of, of bias. And that is often what we do. And it is of course made more challenging by the fact that on college campuses, it is not politically correct to look anti-Semitic, but it is okay to hide your anti-Semitism behind anti-Zionism. So that's what we see again and again. Now, what are the tools that we use? In the Rutgers University case, and then in other cases, when I was the head of OCR, I made clear that in appropriate situations, we need to use IRA. IRA, I-H-R-A, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. That is the one internationally adopted definition of anti-Semitism. And while the anti-Israel activists will say that it's controversial, the fact is that it has been adopted by many countries around the world, and it is mandatory for UK universities to adopt it as well. It has been, been used by the US State Department during the George W. Bush administration, during the Obama-Biden administration, and then during the recent Trump administration. And it's critical, not just for the words it uses to define anti-Semitism, but because it has examples relative to Israel. And those examples are largely based on the Natan Sharansky 3D test. That is to say, Sharansky and 
we all know Sharansky, the Israeli refusenik and human rights activist who became a Knesset member and minister uh, and one of the leading figures in, uh, in, in uh, public Jewish life, I would say. And what Sharansky said that was so smart is that when people criticize Israel, it is not always anti-Semitic, but sometimes it is. And if you want a quick way to figure out when anti-Israel activism is anti-Semitic, look at three Ds. Ask yourself, is Israel being demonized? Not just criticized, as we might criticize other countries, but treated almost as a sinister, evil, or demonic figure, similar to the way in which Jews were treated for centuries. Second, is Israel being delegitimized? Again, not just treated badly, but treated as if it's not a legitimate state as if Israel alone among the countries of the world lacks legitimacy similar to the way in which the Jewish people were treated. And third, are double standards used? In other words, is Israel being criticized not because it doesn't measure up to international law as neutrally considered, but rather is Israel being subjected to a different set of standards than everybody else? If any of those three D apply and context matters, there might be something more than just political disagreement involved. And in those circumstances, what's critical on college campuses is to identify that we're not just dealing with a political disagreement, but rather to change the narrative so that it is understood in the appropriate circumstances that what we're talking about is harassment in a hostile environment. Because if it's just a political debate, then university administrators and others will not want to take sides and maybe they're right. But if we understand that what's happening is in many cases a revival of an ancient hate, then we can make the case and we can prevail in demonstrating that it should be treated not just as a political battle, but as a form of hate and bigotry that should be treated uh, accordingly. A few examples of how it's, how it's been used. Andrea mentioned that I went to Williams College. Well, by coincidence, one of the cases that we had at OCR involved my alma mater. That was in a case in which a group of Jewish students wanted to create a so-called Williams Initiative on Israel that would focus on Israel issues from a perspective that was at least somewhat pro-Israel. After all, there was already an anti-Israel Students for Justice in Palestine group on campus. Well, that became controversial. And for the first time in many years, the college council of Williams College declined uh, to approve a request for a club, even though all of the requirements had been met. OCR investigated the president of Williams College, Maude Mandel, um, to her credit, recognized that the Jewish students had faced discrimination and uh, the college agreed uh, that it would uh, grant uh, the um, club uh, full recognition. In fact, she was moving towards that even before the complaint. Uh, but with the complaint, uh, they agreed that they would uh, do this and that they would agree to be monitored and held accountable. University of North Carolina and Duke University. You might have heard about the uh, very controversial um, conference that they had um, in which, among other things, uh, a singer got up to give what he admitted um, was an anti-Semitic anti song. Um, there were various allegations of anti-Semitism throughout the conference, as well as swastikas uh, on, the, on the campus. Uh, while I was at OCR, we entered an agreement with UNC and another one with Duke, in which, among other things, uh, both institutions agreed to adopt an appropriate definition of anti-Semitism to change their policies and procedures, uh, et cetera. With New York University, there was a courageous young woman, uh, Adela Kohab, who with her uh, classmates uh, stood up against just a large number of uh, alleged incidents, including physical assault. Uh, there was one situation in which a student at a um, uh, rave in the park, um, had a microphone grabbed away and the student was injured uh, in, the, in, in, in the shuffle. New York University agreed uh, to integrate the IRA definition into its student conduct code. There have been other cases uh, as well. Um, 
you may be familiar with our client, Rose Rich at the University of uh, Southern California, uh, where there was an effort by anti-Zionists to impeach her from her position as vice president based on her identity uh, as a Zionist Jewish woman. Uh, we were able to block the impeachment effort, although in light of the immense amount of vitriol that she faced online and otherwise at that university, uh, she had to withdraw uh, as um, uh, vice president of that uh, college council. At the University of Illinois, which is now ongoing, we have seen years uh, of uh, harassment of Jewish students of various kinds, repeated destruction uh, of, uh, of the menorah, uh, swastikas, other uh, vandalism, uh, and uh, hostile environment uh, of various sorts. Using tools like civil rights complaints can help us uh, to give vindication to the students. It can require schools to make changes, which at a minimum can include new policies and procedures. It can push them uh, to use disciplinary procedures, procedures and other uh, mechanisms when students have violated uh, st uh, student rules as well as the rights of, of Jewish students. And it can help us to change the culture on campus so that Ultimately, we want to make sure not that Jewish students have any special or greater rights than anyone else, but so that Jewish students have the same protections as everybody else. And so that they can feel free to express their views to uh, whether they are pro-Israel or not, to have Zionist speakers on campus, if that is their choice, and to make sure that they are treated as full and equal members of the, of the college campus community. Now, there are other issues that are still pending. With the new administration apparently coming on, we will need to make sure that the executive order um, on uh, anti-Semitism stays in place. That is President Trump's order under which the IRA definition, which I described, is used by the Office for Civil Rights uh, in all of its uh, pending cases where appropriate. We'll need to make sure that there is appropriate treatment of Middle East studies programs that appear to have a form of bias that is inconsistent with assurances that they've made under the requirements of the Higher Education Act. And we'll need to make sure that there is not a continuation of the situation in which Qatar and other countries are making multi-million dollar, and in fact, hundreds of millions of dollars, of undisclosed contributions to colleges and universities in violation of federal law. So there are many issues remaining, but I would say right now, uh, the single biggest tool that we have to fight the resurgence of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on college campuses is to use the law. Use the law carefully, use the law prudently, Use the law only when justice is on our side, but use it when we need to, and to be fearless in pursuing justice when justice is on our side. Thank you, and if there are questions, I would be very happy to take them. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ken, thank you so much for that enlightening talk. Uh, it's very encouraging to hear about the legal avenues that Jewish and Zionist students and their allies can pursue to counter this discrimination that we unfortunately see uh, too often. And I think I speak for all of us here when I say that we're very appreciative of everything that you do. Uh, so hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Zach Schildkraut. As Andrea said earlier before Ken's talk, I'm the managing editor for Canvas Campus Department, and I am honored to be here with all of you and to take part in this fascinating and important conversation. So without further ado, uh, let's jump right into Q&A. Uh, all of you who are with us today, uh, hundreds of you, this is incredible. Please send your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it looks like almost two dozen of you have already done that. So thank you, please keep them rolling in and I will try to get to as many as I can. So let's start off right away with a question from one of our sponsors for this event, Dr. Stanley Feldman. So thank you, Dr. Feldman. Uh, and the question is, Anti-Semitic activities on college campuses take many forms, some overt, others covert. So what is the responsibility of university administrators in this environment, given that the primary mission of institutions of higher learning 
is to foster debate and discussion of diverse opinions and views. More particularly at NYU, a department took a public stance on supporting BDS. Uh, so what should a university administration do in this circumstance? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Feldman, both for the question and also for uh, supporting uh, CAMERA's uh, good work um, and this particular uh, webinar. Uh, you are right to focus on the fact that some anti-Semitism is overt and some is covert. And I would say that university administrators are generally good at dealing with what is overt, especially uh, swastikas uh, and uh, obvious uh, neo-Nazism. Uh, and they will sometimes make statements that sound good uh, in condemning anti-Semitism that are uh, bland and that are unspecific. The challenge is that much anti-Semitism is hidden often behind uh, anti-Zionism. And so what is needed from administrators at a minimum is to educate their communities about this. So for instance, in Florida State, the uh, university president issued a strong statement indicating that because of this problem, the university would use the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, which addresses covert anti-Semitism. Now, this was a, a long, uh, a long process to get there. Um, it was immensely helpful that we were able to get uh, the Florida legislature uh, first uh, to pass legislation um, that um, adopted the IRA definition. That made it much easier for a Florida state institu institution to do that. And the Louis D. Brandeis Center is working uh, and has been working with various states around the country on that and has been working on that for, for years now. NYU was, was very important, and I think that uh, while some of the wording of the resolution agreement wasn't uh, perfect, um, I would say that the agreement by the university to not only adopt the IRA definition, but to use it in its disciplinary procedures was crucial. And I think that that is something that we should urge other uh, administrators to do. That is to say, adopt an understanding of what anti-Semitism is to teach their community, but under appropriate circumstances that don't interfere with freedom of speech, it should be used in disciplinary um, uh, situations as well. Now, Dr. Feldman, you also asked specifically about departments that adopt BDS. And what I would say is that there is a significant difference between a professor who in the exercise of academic freedom uh, expresses his or her own views. Now, I think professors should be able to express their own views freely. But when a department uh, adopts um, a, uh, an approach to BDS, that is not the speech of an individual uh, academic. That is the speech of the university. And that is something that no university president should permit. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, it's, it's very encouraging to uh, see New York University adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. It's very important. We're seeing it happen across the pond too. Uh, I saw the other day that Cambridge University just adopted the IRA definition. So these are, these are, these are positive, encouraging developments when, when things can seem grim sometimes. It is, it is positive, Zach. Now, you know, it was uh, fairly recently, just a few weeks ago, that there were uh, articles in, uh, uh, English uh, papers that only 20% of English universities had adopted the IRA definition and the, and the UK Jewish community was angry that there weren't more. And in fact, and in fact, there has been considerable pressure from the UK government to raise that from 20% to 100%. And they're certainly aided when uh, Cambridge University joins in that. Of course, in the United States, we are nowhere near that. And so we need to catch up. Right. Do you, do you think all the developments in the UK have anything to do with the uh, anti-Semitism scandals and labor? Sorry, I don't mean to get too off track. I figured I would just ask for your thoughts on that because it's been such a hot topic. Um, well, sure. I mean, there has been a, a very significant problem of anti-Semitism throughout the UK. And I think that um, with uh, Mr. Corbyn's problems, I think that there has been more awareness there. Uh, and it has been going on for uh, for many years. And I would like us to be similarly sensitive when we see similar problems 
from public figures in the United States as well. Absolutely. So there's a there's a question uh, in the Q and A box here from a Joshua Fetter. Thank you, Joshua. And I think that this question uh, ties in. Well, it does tie into the free speech questions that you were bringing up earlier. So Joshua asks, how uh, how can we respond to uh, university employees who defend anti-Semitic defamatory speech as free speech? So yeah, I guess let's just delve into a little bit more where we draw the line between academic freedom, individual opinions, free speech. I personally am a very big supporter of free speech, um, as I think is appropriate to uh, an organization named after Justice Louis D. Brandeis, who is one of our country's foremost uh, champions of freedom of speech. And I would like to see the Jewish community continue to support freedom of speech, whether it uh, favors uh, the Jewish community in the state of Israel or whether it, um, uh, whether it opposes that. So I think that when people support free speech, um, they're doing the right thing. Uh, defamatory uh, speech is not free speech. Um, there, is, there is no uh, theory of law that I'm familiar with that says that there are no exceptions to free speech and defamation is certainly one, uh, one, one exception. So there are certain exceptions um, and, and they should be acknowledged. I don't think we should try to make the exceptions bigger than they are, uh, but we need to uh, police them. Uh, I think we need to understand that uh, it is Jewish and pro-Israel students who are often the first to be silenced. Uh, and many of the cases that we've been brought into have arisen when uh, Jewish speakers have been uh, silenced or, or harassed in one way or the other, uh, and when Jewish students have not been able to express themselves. So oftentimes one of the biggest challenges that we have is the suppression of uh, free speech on campus. Right, absolutely, and freedom of speech is a, is a two-way street. Uh, Jewish students, Zionist students, pro-Israel students have as much of a right to not be shut down as, as others do who are on the other side, so to speak. So absolutely. absolutely. Um, so I'm reading through the Q&A box here and I'm, I'm noticing a theme. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask this next question, which I think will uh, address a lot of people's uh, questions here. This is kind of addressing an elephant in the room. So I'll, I'll preface this by saying that CAMERA is a nonpartisan organization. We don't endorse politicians. Uh, or political parties, but that being said, we analyze uh, the issues and we we want to stand for the truth and we and we stand uh, against anti-Semitism and anti-Israel hatred, obviously. So uh, I'm going to ask, what can we expect from the incoming uh, Biden administration in terms of these uh, legal efforts in the Department of Education to combat anti-Semitism? Can we expect the incoming administration to enhance these efforts? Can we expect certain efforts to be rolled back? What are your thoughts about that? I think we need to hope for the best and prepare for the worst because the fact is that we just don't know. Um, certainly the Obama-Biden administration did some positive things in this area. Uh, I think that the uh, Democratic Party has a mix of uh, pro and uh, anti-Israel. And I think that's true of uh, the vice president supporters. Uh, I am hopeful that the Biden administration will reflect uh, the former vice president's own record and views more uh, than those of the left wing of his party, uh, but we don't know. So I think that the first thing is we have to try to avoid backsliding. So we need to make sure that it is understood that the Trump executive order on combating anti-Semitism simply institutionalizes the same general approach that the Obama-Biden administration took. And I hope that the incoming administration can take ownership of that and, and, and continue. Similarly, there were other uh, advances uh, against anti-Semitism, uh, including within OCR during this uh, past administration. My hope is that the Biden administration will not slide back on any of them. And perhaps, perhaps they can make some advances. It may be that a Biden administration would feel more comfortable issuing certain kinds of subregulatory guidance than the Trump administration did. Maybe they will make their own mark. My hope is that we can work collaboratively with this administration uh, in good faith uh, to move forward 
um, and to have a very open mind, uh, regardless of which way we voted or how we feel about the administration, to have an open mind. Of course, if worse comes to worse, we'll have to try to overcome uh, any problems. But my hope at this point is that we'll see some positive developments and that we can all do what we can to um, uh, increase the likelihood that that will happen. Yeah, definitely. It's it's difficult to make predictions, but as you said, we can we can hope for the best. So speaking of that executive order, one thing I'm curious about is is something that we've seen in in the campus department is when that executive order was signed, uh, certain anti-Zionist activist organizations on campus, such as Students for Justice in Palestine, Jewish Voice for Peace, groups of that nature, they they responded by saying that this executive order is problematic because it redefines Jews as a nationality, which they argue others them in, in a problematic way. So is this an accurate way to view the executive order? Is there any truth to this? How can we uh, respond to this argument and how do we ensure that that executive order is represented fairly and accurately? No, it's not accurate. It is, however, based, I think, on the New York Times article that was the first to cover the uh, the matter. And I think there were a spate of negative and ill-informed articles that came out very shortly after. Uh, but fortunately, I won't say that they were formal corrections, but I would say that uh, within a fairly short period after, people actually started reading the executive order and realizing uh, that the New York Times got it wrong. And so then I, I would say most of the articles after that have been, uh, have been correct. What the executive order does is two things. Um, and forgive me if I say both of them are based on work that I had done previously at OCR and uh, in at least some cases uh, continued during the uh, Obama administration uh, uh, during the interregnum between my, uh, my service. So the first, there was a question, are Jews even covered under Title VI? So Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is the statute that prohibits, it, it, was, it was created to really to prohibit racial segregation in the schools, but it prohibits discrimination based on race, color, national origin in uh, schools, universities, and other federally funded funded places. Other statutes added uh, sex, uh, age, disability, and membership in certain youth organizations, but religion was never added. And for whatever reason, up until my tenure in 2004, when I served during the George W. Bush administration, OCR tended to say Jews just aren't covered because Jews are just a religion. Well, we know that that's too simplistic. Um, Jewishness has different sorts of attributes and there are different views on that. Uh, some will say it's, it's uh, primarily religion, others that it's more of a peoplehood, that it's, a, it's an ancestry, so on and so forth. The courts have said that if there is a law that prohibits race discrimination, um, in, in at least some contexts, generally Jews should, should get the coverage, not because Jews are a member of a separate race, uh, but for other sorts of reasons why uh, they should get coverage, including that they are, uh, we are one of the groups that Congress had intended uh, to, uh, to, to, to protect. The executive order basically says that uh, Jewish students should get the same protection under Title VI as other groups that have protections under race, color, and national origin. Doesn't mean that Jews are a national origin, doesn't mean that they're a race, it just means that for legal purposes, Jewish students should get the same rights as other students. And the second thing it said, of course, is that the IRA definition should be used by federal agencies like OCR. Absolutely. Thank you for that clarification. That's that's very helpful. And, and this is helpful information that we can use in the, in the campus department to communicate with our students because stu uh, the students that we work with will hear these canards on their campuses and they'll come to us to ask for help with, with how to deal with it. So for our purposes, uh, thank you, Ken. That's That's very that's very helpful for us. Uh, and speaking of, of uh, college campus uh, issues, discrimination, um, and how we can use the law to combat it when our cause is just and when it's on our side, as you said earlier, uh, there's somebody asking a question here. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounce uh, this name. I apologize. Uh, Victor uh, Mishkevich. Uh, so thank you, Victor, for this question. And he is asking about uh, what is the status of the BDS movement specifically on campuses 
nowadays and also what is the status of the fight against it. And Victor also adds that uh, from what he knows, the Trump administration uh, has, has proposed pulling federal funds from universities or university departments where the BDS movement is, is active on, on their campuses or, or institutional. So what is the status of this? Well, the BDS movement is, is, is still active on campuses and so is the opposition. Um, campuses are in a strange and difficult place right now with the coronavirus. Um, and yet uh, anti-Israel activism uh, still persists. Um, I, I think that um, I think we'll see much more of it probably in the spring. Uh, right now, campuses, on the one hand, there have been these horrible challenges as a result of um, COVID-19. On the other hand, there have been other issues uh, like Black Lives Matter that have taken um, center stage. And yet, nevertheless, uh, we have seen um, uh, BDS resolutions at the University of Illinois and elsewhere, even during uh, the Jewish high holidays. Um, sometimes, and this is a, a twist on it, sometimes manipulated to take advantage of the progressive um, uh, moral and political views of Jewish students. So a resolution will be offered that not only condemns Israel, but also condemns uh, anti-black racism in some fashion, so that Jewish students are put in a difficult position because they want to speak out against racism. And if they don't speak out against racism, they'll be considered a racist. And so the anti-Israel activists put them in a position where they either accept uh, condemnation of Israel or um, will be painted as a racist themselves. So we've seen that as a, as a new development. So BDS unfortunately con continues and it continues to morph and to combine with various forms of, um, of anti-racism. We also see other strategies that have been both insidious and strong. I would say anti-normalization uh, has been very significant. That is to say efforts to um, block uh, Jewish students and Jewish organizations and pro-Israel organizations from participating uh, equally uh, on campus life, uh, for instance, uh, preventing them from participating in a Know Your Rights Fair at San Francisco State or, or participate in other activities at NYU and, 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 and elsewhere. So that's, that's going on. Uh, the Trump administration, the President Trump made some strong statements about uh, uh, BDS. The Trump administration did not actually say at any time that uh, universities would lose funding merely because the students adopted a BDS resolution. However, oftentimes in the, in the course of uh, adopting an anti-Semitic BDS resolution, they will do other things that cross the line and that can jeopardize the uh, university's funding. And when that happens, of course, we have to be alert and we have to hold the universities accountable if they fare to, fail to respond. Right. I, I think with the federal funding uh, questions. Uh, this is an issue I've, I've had the opportunity to write a, a few op-eds about during my time with camera, but from what I understand, there are questions about funding that's allocated to universities under Title VI of the Higher Education Act, which is distinct from Title VI of, of the Civil Rights Act. So maybe we could, we could delve into that for a few minutes. Um, sure. Uh, so Title VI of the Civil Rights Act is the civil rights statute, the anti-discrimination statute that I mentioned. Title VI of the Higher Education Act creates Middle East studies programs and other area studies programs that were developed really starting with the Eisenhower administration to try to create a pipeline of young people people who were trained in foreign languages and cultures and who would be able to support national security uh, by um, uh, applying for jobs with the CIA and the military and, and, and so on and so forth. That was the purpose of it. But what we have found over the last decade or, or more, uh, starting with the, I would say, the um, uh, scholarship of Martin Kramer um, is that these, 
uh, Middle East studies programs have often been twisted against their original purpose. They're no longer serving uh, U.S. national security interests. And in fact, in some cases, they're anti-American. And the professors who get these funds would be mortified if any of their students ever were to uh, join the CIA uh, and to use the, the skills. And so what in fact they've become uh, is um, uh, in some cases, uh, indoctrination centers. Congress passed a law several years ago. It was, it was, it was an amended, amendment to the Higher Education Act, a reauthorization of the Higher Education Act that halfway dealt with this. Uh, it required applicants for these funds to certify that they would provide a diversity of perspectives and a balance of views. And that's all they said. The education department, unfortunately, never issued regulations spelling out what it meant. And so for years, for years, the department would receive applications from these horrible programs and the applications would be thick. And some bureaucrat would go through them and check to see if there was a, a, a page or two pages that said something about diversity and then give them a check. And so maybe it would say that our program has um, uh, white anti-Israel people and black anti-Israel people, and we've got uh, a woman, and uh, so we've got we've got diversity of perspectives. Uh, or uh, some of them will talk about how some of their anti-Israel scholars were sociologists, but others were historians, and then there's the anth anthropologists. Um, so the Brandeis Center and several other organizations as well uh, uh, went to the. Obama administration first, and then there's been activity in the in the uh, Trump administration to get some enforcement of this. Uh, so we 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 finally convinced the education department to start scoring the um, uh, the applications. That is to say, to give more points if their application made sense. Actually, to read them and does it actually address and and then. Uh, to check afterwards to see if they've done that. So there's something that's being done. And my colleague, Assistant Secretary John King, within the Education Department, uh, to, with support from, uh, uh, from uh, Acting uh, General Counsel Reed, Reed Rubenstein, they've, uh, they've done some investigations uh, and they've exposed uh, programs that have, have not provided the uh, required diversity of perspectives and, and balance of views, but not enough is, 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 is being done because the statute still doesn't have enforcement teeth. It's, it, still doesn't, it still doesn't provide the tools that the government needs in order to make sure that this congressional requirement of certification is taken seriously. And as a result, many of these programs continue to be extreme anti-Israel, uh, indoctrination uh, centers uh, that support uh, BDS and have narrowly one-sided views of, of, of uh, Israel. Yeah, I, I think this is such an important development. And I'm personally, I'm I'm looking forward to watching the developments and, and to see what ends up happening. To me, at least, it seems like this is a different issue than academic freedom, because from what I understand, nobody in the government is telling departments, you can't make these arguments, you can't say these things, you're, you're not allowed to advocate for BDS from your own personal views. It seems that they're talking about what federal funding is and isn't allowed to go towards. So to me, at least, it, it seems like a, a different issue entirely, but, but a lot of people misrepresent what's happening, I think. Well, well, just to be clear, I think that academic freedom is sometimes involved and that it's important right. to enforce this in a way that doesn't encroach on academic freedom. That's not a not a frivolous, uh, not a frivolous argument. But what I, I think the, the groups on our side are asking for is not less speech, but not but but more speech. In other words, uh, the goal in terms of Higher Education Act reform hasn't been that um, professors shouldn't be able to state their views, but that if a university wants a particular kind of grant, and it has some professors who are expressing the anti Israel views, provide some that are on the pro-Israel side as well. So not less speech, but more speech. Absolutely, and hopefully we, we see those changes being implemented or, or continue to be implemented in, in, in the near future. Uh, so we have an interesting question uh, here from Naya Left. Uh, thank you, Naya. Um, and, and the question is, uh, you mentioned, or you mentioned earlier near the beginning of, of your great talk that for, for the past couple decades or so, we've, we've 
been moving in the wrong direction in terms of combating anti-Semitism on campus or that we haven't been doing enough, uh, arguing that there are, or implying that there are correct and incorrect methods to, to push back against this hatred. Uh, so in what way uh, more specifically are we moving in the wrong direction or, or in what way could we be doing more? Could you uh, please expand on that? Um, although we're not doing enough to make sure we've got the right data, I would say that the number of incidents has been increasing on college campuses. And I would also say that uh, when Jewish students talk about their experience, the number of Jewish students who are experiencing anti-Semitic incidents has, has been increasing. And then um, qualitatively, if one looks at what's happening on college campuses, there is a, there's just a, both a sort of a volume and an intensity uh, of uh, anti-Zionism that is, is much greater than it had been uh, in the past. Um, in some ways, it's particularly challenging for uh, liberal and progressive uh, Jewish students who are pro-Israel, who will often face uh, intense uh, animosity uh, and pressures uh, uh, to be excluded from the, uh, the groups that which, which they would like to participate in. Um, so I'm sorry, the second half of the question was what should we be doing more of? Uh, is that it in terms of the pushback? What, what yeah. additional reactions? Yeah. I mean, there are lots of different, there are lots of different approaches. Uh, and as, as I said, I think education is, is an important part of it, but, but part of it has to be fighting back part of it. And I would say to the extent that we are working even collaboratively with universities to, uh, to increase situations, sometimes it's a threat of litigation. What would I like to see more of? I would like to see a better understanding of what is anti-Semitism and how is it related to anti-Zionism. And I would like to see that um, in a variety of different places. Certainly I would like to see it in uh, statements from presidents and deans. I would like to see it in training and orientation. I would like to see that every university that has anti-racism training should have training about anti-Semitism and it should be absolutely as clear on this issue as they are clear about racism and sexism and other forms of, of discrimination. I would like to see academic programs on anti-Semitism that are as robust as the programs on um, racism and, and, and sexism. And I would like to see universities, instead of being um, petri dishes uh, for the worst kinds of viral anti-Semitism, instead to be partners in fighting uh, this form of uh, ignorance and, and bigotry and, and, and doing so using what they're strongest at, which is to say um, they're, they're teaching and research and education tools. And I would like Jewish students uh, to be as comfortable on campus as, as, as any other group. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and hopefully we see those, those efforts and, and measures implemented on college campuses more and more uh, in the years to come. So what, one thing I'm curious about, which I want to touch on really quickly, is, is I'm wondering how Israeli nationality plays into, plays into all of this. That's, that's a really good question, because on the one hand, for years, we've been trying to make clear that um, some of the hatred against, uh, against Israel is also anti-Jewish. And whether there are Israeli students involved or not, sometimes this anti-Zionism is an affront to Jewish identity, because not all, but many Jewish students consider Zionism to be uh, an integral part of their own um, their own identity, their own ethnic or ancestral uh, identity. And, and, and that has to be considered. But at the same time, we need to understand that Israeli Americans are coming into their own as, a, as an American group uh, that is as important uh, as any other. And that requires uh, both the same celebration and also the same protections as any other group. And that some of what we're seeing on campus is a, a hostile environment, not just for Jewish students in general, but, but specifically for Israeli American students. And I think that universities need to recognize that in addition to the general protections for Jewish students, that Israeli students have been especially under fire. It's, and, and that's particularly true in the in the case of Israeli veterans, um, and 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 they need uh, the same degree of civil rights protection as any other group. Yeah, absolutely. Just from a discrimination based on national origin uh, perspective, I, I would find it hard to believe that if if a, a 
academic department institutionally opposes the existence of the, of Israel, then I, I don't see how that wouldn't be a hostile environment towards towards his Israeli students. I, I'm obviously not a lawyer, but it seems like you could make a very good case for discrimination based on national origin. So we here we see the double the double standards that uh, Sharansky talked about. Um, of course, it seems to be okay on college campuses to treat Israeli Americans in a way that they get it would not be okay for any other group. And so we just have to change that way of thinking. Right, so speaking of those double standards, we have a, a question rolling in here that, that I think ties neatly into this topic from uh, Shira Nave Haman, thank you Shira. So the question pivots back to the Williams College issue. Uh, and, and Shira is asking, uh, you mentioned that the Williams College Israel group was approved uh, after having agreed to be monitored and held accountable. So was this requirement for, was this requirement put in place for the Students for Justice in Palestine organization or any other group, or was there a, a double standard being implemented against this Israel organization? Well, there, there'd been a double standard, and I hate to say that because uh, I love Williams College. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry to have a, uh, have a focus on my alma mater here. Um, no, so um, the College Council refused to give the acceptance to the Williams Initiative on Israel, and it was never required to reverse that. President Mandel um, said that she would provide a different form of recognition, the president's own recognition to the group. And the president's statement, uh, the, the, the statement from the uh, college's representative suggested that the Israel group would get many or most of the same uh, uh, privileges as other groups. Um, they later changed that to say, well, no, we meant all of them. And so it was the resolution agreement that ensured that they would receive all of the same uh, benefits uh, as any other organization, even though they were approved through a different process. Right. Uh, okay, well, it looks like we are almost uh, out of time, but I think we have time for maybe one or two uh, more questions. I, you know what, I think this is a good question to, uh, to, to close out on. We have a question coming in from Richard Sherman, and the question is, how important are letters from camera members to college administrators uh, and college newspapers protesting anti-Semitism on their campuses? Um, they're effective. They're particularly effective from those camera members who are uh, alumni. Uh, you know, if you if you write to your own university, that that carries uh, more weight. Uh, letters to the editor um, in general help. It's always useful to um, make sure that there's not an imbalance of, of, of anti anti Israel. So I would say letters to especially to your own college or university or to other institutions that you support that you might be a donor of, for instance. Uh, letters to your elected officials, uh, or perhaps urging your public of elected officials to send letters uh, to the university or to uh, the executive branch of, of government. Uh, those are all those are all very helpful. Definitely. And Richard, you should know that over in the campus department, we have a fellowship program where we work with college students directly one on one day in and day out to help them push back against this stuff. And, and we help them to construct well-argued, well-reasoned op-eds, which we, which we try to submit to school papers. And, and we get lots of camera fellow op-eds published in, in, in school papers. So it's a really uh, important and, and great effort. Uh, okay, so unfortunately it looks like we're, we're almost running, uh, or we're running out of time here, but thank you, Ken. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation for, for all of us. Uh, I wish we could chat about this all day. I, I love talking about this stuff. It's very encouraging to hear about the efforts that are being implemented to help Jewish students. Uh, but yeah, un unfortunately we can't go all day. Our time is just uh, about up. So once again, uh, I want to say that we are immensely grateful to Stanley and Beth Feldman for sponsoring today's event. Thank you to both of you. And thank you to all of our supporters. Your backing is what makes our work possible. We couldn't do this without you. And this work is more important now than ever as, as we're hearing from, as we, just heard from from this crucially important webinar. The coronavirus crisis may have put a damper on on-campus activities, but the online anti-Zionist activism is increasingly prolific, unfortunately, 
And uh, so as I was just mentioning a couple minutes ago, our campus department works directly with students to push back against this. Uh, we work with not only camera fellows, but also camera supported groups, student groups, uh, independent Israel groups on campus. We help them counter blatant falsehoods about Israel and Zionism and even outright anti-Semitism uh, when they overlap and very frequently they do. Uh, so speaking of which, uh, for those of you on this webinar, if any of your loved ones, friends, friends of friends, et cetera, are college students who may wanna get involved with this, with this imperative work, including, uh, but of course not limited to op-ed writing, uh, educational event organizing, please do not hesitate to send them our way. Uh, we were very friendly people, we promise. We are always happy to chat with new students about our programs. Um, and when it comes to uh, this crucially important work of standing up for Jewish and Zionist students on campus, uh, I think this webinar has, has affirmed, it has reminded us that effective legal advocacy is imperative and CAMERA is, is very proud to have worked with you, Ken, and the rest of the Brandeis Center throughout the years. So thank you once again, Ken, uh, and to the Brandeis Center for everything that you do to help Jewish and Zionist students and their allies on campus. So this concludes today's program. Thank you again, everyone.